Hey everybody, today I am going to be reviewing Lawrence of Arabia. This film came out in 1962 and it was directed by David Lean, one of the most legendary British filmmakers of the 20th century. He's somebody who always appeared to me to be a dreamer, somebody very ambitious and very interested in a lot of historical epic events. Also a meticulous editor and just a brilliant craftsman all around, so really the perfect person to adapt a story such as this. Lawrence of Arabia is a film very close to my heart, and I always look back fondly on it because it sort of, it feels almost like a symbol, like a turning point in my adolescence where I really began to take film history seriously. And I hadn't seen the movie in a long time, but I mean, Lawrence of Arabia is still all those things that I mentioned. It really, really does stagger the imagination just in terms of the scope and the ambition of it, but also I think understanding what it means to be very methodical in your approach of that ambition. Just being so self-assured, the confidence within yourself to be able to allow for these very haunting silences in the movie, for kind of breathtakingly beautiful moments that don't necessarily mean anything, and really taking the time to, to relish in that. And the massive scope certainly captures that, that epic feeling and that, that romanticism of war. Um, in certain ways through the very grand cinematography, but I think it also um, can be mirrored in very complex, very ambiguous ways, particularly through the protagonist, who is, of course, T.E. Lawrence, played by Peter O'Toole in a very famous performance. He, as a character at least, is very peculiar, kind of contradictory character. He's meant to be this, this big war hero, of course, but I you don't often see characters like that portrayed in this way or focused on in this way, which to me was always what set this film apart partially and what made it very interesting. This is more of a thoughtful epic for me. It's more sophisticated in terms of the tone and how it presents its characters and its themes compared to a lot of the more melodramatic epics of the time. A lot of the uh, historical epic films, American films of the time, particularly in the 50s and in the 60s, they were more soap operas. They would typically have very sweeping romantic love stories like Cleopatra, or they would be these really romanticized biblical epics in the fashion of Ben-Hur or the Ten Commandments. But in this film it does feel more in a strange way, even though it is so huge in scope, it feels more intimate than all of that. The character, it uses the character of Lawrence as a symbol for that ambiguity, as I mentioned, um, but for that feeling of, of lacking an identity and searching for it despite being an outsider throughout your life. But we also use this character as our vehicle, like so we can live vicariously through them and we can experience a lot of that confliction, probably that we do in our real lives, the idea of romanticizing a culture or a movement or a war without really understanding the realities and the complexities behind what all of that means, what, especially the sacrifice. There's a line in the movie that's towards the beginning of the second half of the movie where the American journalist asks Lawrence if why he's so fond of the desert, and Lawrence replies, it's clean, uh, to which the, the journalist says that's a very illuminating answer, and I, I would agree with him. I think there is something to that response that gives us an idea of what the desert could represent in a larger perspective. It's clean in a way that most nature isn't. It's not muddy, it's not muggy, um, and there's something about that blankness that is so intimidating as though it was you know like a void yeah just sand for miles and miles and miles does the environment of that gives you a very lonely feeling a melancholy feeling and i think that lawrence is both of those things just inherently as a personality and it's that melancholia and that isolation partially that he is drawn to because i think it is a reflection of who he is. Always an outsider, even in his own country, and yet he's never quite fitting in with the Arabs as well. At least maybe not in the ways that he initially predicted. But I think there's also, on the flip side of that, there's also something very grand and uh, majestic about the desert that is quite, in a way, romantic and exotic. And I feel like they were able to capture both sides of that coin quite well, an emptiness and a conflict, as well as something to really marvel at. And really, this is some of the best cinematography for me and some of the best tension building in a big Hollywood epic that I've ever seen. Those shots go on for prolonged periods of time and there's a lot of uninterrupted silence throughout. And I think it is absolutely perfect for building that tension, lulling you into a sort of hypnosis where you don't know what's going to happen. And all of that I think can be rather haunting. And those shots 
of the mirages in the distance where you just see like a dot on the horizon and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. To me, that is astounding. And those are some of my favorite moments. And certainly the, the famous uh, entrance of Sheriff Ali in the desert in the beginning of the film. Yeah, that's one of my favorite character entrances of all time. And it is iconic. It's a knockout of a scene. It really is using the simplicity and the silence to draw something out of that kind of flattened composition and suddenly make it dimensional to me is very, very thrilling. And those mirages can be very, very trippy. And you have to think that people like this that are in the desert, that's all they see for miles and miles for months, maybe years, it's got to mess with your mind. I would start to go insane personally. I'm pretty positive I would. So that feeling of kind of knowing or wondering what is or what isn't there to me is a real threat to you. But all of that to me contributes to the internal unease of the film throughout, particularly for Lawrence. Um, but it's never spelled out or, or forced down our throats in any sort of way like that. It more unfolds within the character internally and we more see the external aftermath of him losing his grip on reality, but also losing his grip on his own morals and his own sanity. And a lot of it comes from, at least in terms of how it's represented in the film, you know, a lot of it I think comes from, you know, a bruised ego, someone who is just naturally off balance. And they make that clear in very subtle ways in the opening of the film, that there's just something a little bit off about Lawrence, especially when he has the, you know, the match with the flame and he's saying the trick William Potter is not minding that it hurts. That's a somewhat famous line in the movie. And of course they use that match again in the famous transition when Brighton says you have a very funny sense of fun. And of course, Lawrence blows out the flame and instantly, boom, it, it cuts right to the desert and we see the sun rising. And it's so quick, it's just like a snap. And I think that's one of the most brilliant transitions ever for me, or one of the most notable. Just the abrupt transition of it is something you don't really see very much anymore, where we're suddenly just, wow, we are engulfed by this place and the silence, the, the culture shock of it. This transition is right up there for me with the, the 2001 uh, transition where, you know, he throws up the bone and suddenly it cuts to the spaceship. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, I think, between the two. We gradually begin to see that, yes, Lawrence does have a very funny sense of what it means to have fun. And perhaps he is a bit overconfident in his abilities or becomes overconfident, clouded by the mystique of things to a point. And though I think he's, he's strong-willed and well-intentioned just in terms of his motivations for everything, his moral co compass does start to wane. And that match to me, even though it's only at the beginning, to me it reflects someone who is very brave and very bold and willing to take risks, certainly, but also somebody who is maybe a little bit sensitive and maybe drawn to extremes in a way that might be a little bit unhealthy. Might have a bit of a, a masochistic streak there too. I really do think that Peter O'Toole is perfectly cast in this film. I know that I think Albert Finney originally was supposed to star and then they were throwing around names like Marlon Brando and, and even Montgomery Cliff. Ultimately, I'm really glad that the role did go to O'Toole just because I think that what he's able to capture in the character just works really perfectly. Um, because he really does get the awkwardness as well as the intellect. He's definitely even a bit effeminate in the role. I think a lot of people would agree. And all of those different facets are very interesting and not common, particularly in a war hero, at least in terms of the ones we might've seen at the time who were typically more kind of these masculine sort of stoic stereotypical characters. Nothing about him blends in down to just his, his little mannerisms. And that to me is really good character building because it's, it's in the details. Because Lawrence does have quite a journey throughout this film. It's quite a burden to carry on an actor's shoulders and because he's going to have to be tested in so many different ways. Though for me, I will say at times, particularly in the second part of the film after the intermission, I think that the character development can at times be a little bit abrupt and his motivations at times can seem more rushed than they do feel organic. And I think part of it is because they do a really, really good job of setting up his character, giving us very subtle hints and it builds very slowly in the first half. Um, but then it starts to lose that tone and it kind of starts to fizzle a little bit. The second half just to me doesn't capture the same allure as the first half and the slow uh, tension building of it. It just feels a little bit more chaotic. And yes, that is partially the point of it. But at the same time, the motivations feel a little bit muddled at times or perhaps unearned, but not to any big extent. I am more nitpicking with this film because overall, I really do think that this film is 
very intelligently and intuitively built. There is a real instinct here for less is more and really letting the smaller moments or the moments of silence carry the emotional weight. And though we see shades of Lawrence's eventual behavior in the first half of the film and the tension of him starting to feel all this internal conflict with these different emotions, it doesn't quite resonate in the same way at, uh, towards the end of the film because I feel like we are held more at a distance. And that might be partially the point because a lot of the characters, particularly Sheriff Ali and, and Auda Butai, they, they, they feel a distance from Lawrence as he's beginning to isolate himself from everyone. But I still feel like the motivation and the speed at which certain conclusions are drawn here just don't feel as, as natural. And that's part of why I feel a little bit disconnected from it. Though I am kind of nitpicking because when I do think overall, the overall tone, I naturally just think about when I think about Lawrence and Lawrence of Arabia is I, I think so much about how things are inferred and insinuated rather than spelled out for us as so many uh, film epics of the time did and they still do. So many of them I think just get overwhelmed by the massive scope of everything and they feel the need to sort of break the tension a little bit by giving us maybe like a romantic subplot so that it can contrast the other elements of the film. Strangely for me when I think about this movie yes it is epic in scope but at, a, at the same time, it also feels strangely intimate. And how they're able to find the balance between those two things, to me, is really extraordinary and very rare. We see this certainly in, in characters, I think, but also as well in the majestic score, which is, yes, majestic, but also has a, a, an, an intimacy to it at certain times. The main theme by Maurice Jarre, I think, is, is it's so special. It's exquisite. It is one of my favorite scores of all time and he did such amazing work work for particularly for David Lean and for me this is right up there with Dr. Zhivago as one of the great things he ever did and one of the great American film scores. I just really cannot imagine a movie like this being made today. I know a lot of people like to ask that question but I, I just think that it was all about timing. I think that the attention to detail that they're taking here uh, to get everything as authentic as possible just couldn't be done today. I think it took them something like two years to make this film. Financially today that just wouldn't be feasible and nor would you want to take this kind of, of risk, especially to trust in modern audiences to be able to sit here and really go along with the more methodical nature of the script. But at least there was a time where a movie like this could be made and we have it kind of as that time capsule. And I really do think this is one of the great achievements in film and something that you certainly should watch if you are a fan of film history or a cinephile, you appreciate good cinematography, you appreciate good writing, all of that. And that is my review. Thank you all for listening. All my social media information is below. You can watch more videos here and you could subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.